What you see booting up on screen is the startup of one of the first Linux distributions, the Soft Landing Linux System, or SLS. SLS's legacy would help form the basis of modern Linux distributions. On those grounds alone, it merits taking a closer look at this interesting piece of history. I'm your host, N Commander, and let us step back to 1991 with Linus Torvald's famous Usenet post. Linux was first released to the world with a post in the CompOS Minix group with the following announcement. Hello everyone out there using Minix. I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby. Won't be big and professional like GNU for 386-486 AT clones. Interest in Linus's hobbyist project quickly exploded. It wasn't long before there was significant user interest in Linux. In and of itself, Linux is not a complete system. Instead, it is what's known as a kernel. Kernels form the core of any operating system and in turn allows other software to be run. For Linux to be usable, it had to be combined with other software, primarily that of the Free Software Foundation's GNU project. What Soft Landing provided was what would become known as a Linux distribution. A pre-compiled version of Linux, a set of core programs, and additional add-on software in one complete package. Branding itself as giving gentle touchdowns from DAW's bailouts, SLS was intended to lower the barrier of entry to use Linux. Actually installing Soft Landing Linux is something of an adventure. SLS was available in three forms, floppy disk, CD-ROM, or as a quick 40 tape. Copies were also released as a set of downloadable files from bulletin board systems. The last release, 1.05, has only survived as such a download. To actually install SLS, the downloaded files had to be converted back to usable floppy disks. The readme file specifically notes how this is done, but to save myself a lot of effort, I wrote a quick Python script to automatically remaster the media. This gave me a collection of 31 floppy disks. For emulating older systems, I like to use Sarah Walker's PCM, which can use error correct hardware complete with BIOS support and a good selection of vintage video adapters. I initially started with an Award 46 clone to kick things off. One thing that had been warned in what little notes I could find was related to time. At least some versions of SLS have known issues relating to years past 1996 due to faulty leap year calculations. There are also some Y2K bugs. To save myself a lot of hassle, I simply set the system clock back to 1994. With that done, I put the A1 disk in, rebooted the system, and crossed my fingers. I was rewarded with Lilo's startup prompt and the Linux kernel slowly beginning to boot before I was eventually dumped to a login prompt. According to a few notes I had found, I had to manually create a partition with fdisk. This wasn't hard, but it did require the user to know how to use fdisk. In comparison, even DAWs of this era provided a graphical tool to do this. One reboot later, and I was able to format the root partition and kick off the installation. The installer sets a nice green and black screen color and then asks a few simple questions to get going. However, it choked trying to set up a swap file. Nonetheless, I persevered and was told to remove the boot disk and insert A2. This began a long and slow install process. And when I say slow, I mean slow as in 30 minutes of just sitting there swapping floppies. It gave me time to contemplate the meaning of life, to catch up with my reading, to solve the problem of... Well, I think you get the point. It took a while. About two thirds of the way in, I hit a rather concerning error where the installer suddenly complained that disk X2 could not be found. At the moment, I had X1 in and the installer had not prompted for X2. Changing the disk to X2 and retrying got the installation going again. What I suspect is one of SLS's many scripting and packaging bugs. This is a good time to talk about the fall of Soft Landing Linux. While SLS was very popular at the time, it was also rather buggy. Slackware and Debian were both started out of frustration with SLS. I also personally ran into some rather obnoxious issues. The first one came near the end of installation. The final installation step of any Linux distribution is to install a bootloader. Soft Landing prompts to create a boot disk with the Linux kernel before trying to install Lilo. 
Creating the boot disk worked and then install prompted me if I wanted to dual boot with DOS. It then installed Lilo. Rather critically though, it did not install to the correct place. On older PCs, the initial boot code is contained in what's known as the master boot record, which is the first 512 bytes of a hard disk. Without the MBR, the system would either fail to boot, or, as in my case, it would simply hang. What SLS actually does is install LILO to the PBR, or partition boot record, and then tries to mark that partition as active. Installing LILO to the PBR means that a DAWS boot record could be used to start the system, but the end result means that DAWS or another master boot record would have to be installed first. Since I started with a blank hard drive, I didn't have Microsoft's MBR installed, and this led to the system hang. In general, partition booting is unreliable at best, and a main reason why later Linux distributions install LILO or GRUB to the MBR and not the PBR. Rather annoyingly, I didn't catch this mistake at the time. I had initially ran the problem off as a LILO issue. A lot of older systems have issues loading with LILO. The typical fix was either a dedicated boot disk or the DAWS-based load LIN. It wasn't until later, while debugging the network, did I eventually find the mistake in LILO.conf and correct it. Regardless, with the boot disk, I was able to bring soft landing up for the first time and began exploring the system. The only user is root with no password. Upon login, we get a banner with soft landing software's phone number and slogan, followed by the instructions relating to mesh and sys setup. Mesh, which I assume stands for menu shell, is soft landing's attempt at easing new users into Linux. At first glance, it bears a striking resemblance to the popular Norton Commander for DAWs. Mesh allows the file system to be browsed graphically and provides shortcuts for simple tasks like editing files. For someone migrating from DAWs, this provides a pretty good introduction to using Linux, and I have to give Soft Landing credit here. Even without using the built-in help, I was able to figure out how to navigate the system, and Mesh is about on par with usability with the Norton Commander and other similar DAWs interfaces. While I haven't used it extensively, this would indeed help give users a soft landing, so to speak, in migrating. This is also seen in the default install load. In addition to the standard Vim and Emacs packages, soft landing is one of the few distributions that I've seen that installs the Joe editor by default. For those not familiar with Joe, it's a clone of WordStar, an extremely popular CPM and DAWs text editor. WordStar to this day still has a rather strong following, and many famous authors, such as George R. R. Marin, the author of A Song of Fire and Ice, still use the DAWs-based versions of WordStar to this day. Just in case anyone was wondering, I was a WordPerfect user. It does, however, make me wonder how much Soft Landing was trying to emulate DAWs. Rather curiously, Soft Landing does not prompt at any point to create a non-root user. Running as root would mean that Linux was much more similar to DAWs with a lack of user permissions. Even for the era, running as root all the time would have been considered bad practice. Sadly, Soft Landing's original documentation appears lost to time, so I don't know if this is something the manual goes into detail about. In addition to mTools and FAT compatibility out of the box, Soft Landing also includes DAWsEMU, a DAWs emulator. Unlike most of SLS, DAWsMU is shipped in source code form. It also requires the user to have a copy of DAWs and has a lengthy README file documenting how to set it up and compile it. In the interest of science, I decided to try it. After all, what could be more awesome than running your old DAWs applications on Linux? Joking aside, actually setting up DAWsMU was somewhat difficult. Assuming you had a full install of soft landing, Make Do Everything kicks off the compilation process. The next step depends on your setup. If you already have DAWs installed somewhere, you can edit the config and just load that. However, if you're running Linux only, you instead have an HD image, which is a micro hard drive for DAWs. A DAWs boot disk must be inserted and then DAWsm launched with the DAWs A command, which boots from the floppy. FDisk and Sys are then used to finish setting up the micropartition, at which point you can start the emulator fully. Linux directories can be mapped into the emulator with the lredr command, which functions very similar to NetWare's map command. 
A list of known compatible software is included. WordPerfect 5.1, which is listed as supported, worked just fine. Doom, however, crashed the emulator entirely. Interestingly, Windows 3.0 is listed as supported in real mode. However, the installer hung when I tried it. Speaking of Windows, users that are familiar with Linux may notice that I'm ignoring the rather large elephant in the room. Or maybe more appropriately, ignoring the X on the window. <clears throat> I am not going to apologize for that pun. What you're seeing on screen is a collection of failed attempts to get X properly up and running. For those not familiar with Linux or Unix in general, X is the standard graphical user interface for these systems. Soft landing includes X386 version 1.2. I wouldn't be surprised if most of the older Linux users are now clutching their keyboards in fear. Up until the early 2000s, getting a working X environment could border on a legitimate miracle. Let's start with the basics. X itself has a very short list of graphics adapters it supports. This can be seen in Soft Landing's SysSetup utility, which has helpful options to select your mouse and X driver. This version of X predates the VESA Video BIOS extensions by at least six months. As such, getting X to work in anything above 640 by 480 resolution requires specific support for a given graphics adapter. You'd think, well, why didn't I just try running at VGA? I did. Here's the result. While X would indeed start, it would get stuck in virtual desktop mode, which meant the whole screen scrolled. It wasn't exactly a useful way to use the system. From personal experience, a minimum resolution of 800 by 600 is needed to have an actually usable X system. That meant you need an accelerated X server or a graphics card supported by the SVGA driver. Out of the box, as seen here in Sys Setup, drivers are provided for ATI's Mach 8 and 32 cards, S3's line of graphics cards, Intel PS2 graphics, and then are followed by the more generic VGA and SVGA drivers. One of the reasons I like PCM is it has a very large list of graphics cards it can emulate. However, it did not have any specific support for any of these devices. Of the options in PCM, it had support for ATI's Mach 64, but neither the Mach 8 nor 32 driver would load. S3 drivers got a bit further, but then complained about unknown chipset. Even the tried and true Circus Logic chips tapped out. Frustration was, needless to say, a bit high at this point. I eventually stumbled upon the README file for the SVGA driver, which had some useful notes about Trident video cards. PCM does support these, but not any of the specific models listed. That being said, it has something close, the Trident TVGA 8900D. This, combined with some edits to xconfig to set my resolution, got X up and running. Which was just in time to discover that my mouse didn't work. Either it would jump around on screen, or refuse to click. When running on a 486, PCM emulates a serial mouse, and I was wondering if something was conflicting. I switched emulation to a Pentium machine so I could use a more standardized PS2 mouse. I then ran Sys Setup to change the configuration. Unfortunately, no joy. At this point, I was reading through most of the man pages and searching old Usenet posts for help. Eventually, I noticed that there's a specific section in xconfig related to mouse support. Unlike later X386 versions, there's no input section. In this case, I needed to replace Microsoft with PS2 and bingo, working mouse support. That being said, I was rather confused. What was SysSetup doing when I selected the mouse driver? Was it updating the wrong file or was I doing something wrong? Upon a deeper examination, all SysSetup was actually doing was changing the dev mouse link to point to various mice devices. Without changing X's configuration, this would just lead to a broken mouse. There is no indication here that you have to manually edit xconfig. I can only assume that was in the manual I don't have. I do, however, strongly suspect that behavior like this is what earns Soft Landing's reputation for being buggy. Anyway, we're out of time on this video. 
In the next part, we're going to start exploring the graphical part of soft landing, getting networking up and running, and then taking a stab at patching the Y2K bugs out of soft landing Linux. If you're interested in seeing those videos, hit that subscribe button and leave a like. If we can reach 250 subscribers, I'll look at doing a special to see if I can get SLS installed on my ThinkPad 380D. As usual, if you want to follow my adventures in real time, follow me on Twitter or join my Discord. Until next time, this is N Commander, signing off. Music